Good? Okay.
Good morning. Good morning. That's what I was waiting for. Welcome to Live Oak. Please rise in body or spirit for our gathering hymn, number 153. Oh, I woke up this morning. Joanna. In this sacred space, we gather as one, celebrating the tapestry of our diversity, honoring the boundless love that unites us all. Live Oak Unitarian Universalist Church is unambiguously, unapologetically progressive, and our doors swing wide to embrace all who seek a welcoming place where we celebrate the LGBTQIA community, where we know that every identity is a divine expression of humanity, where we commit to the work of dismantling systemic racism and other oppressions, striving for a world where equity, compassion, and justice are the cornerstones of our shared existence. May our worship today be a source of inspiration, a wellspring of courage, and a call to action. Welcome, dear friends, to this place of love, acceptance, and progress. My name is Michael Inyart, and I want to give a special welcome to any visitors we may have here, whether you're in person or online. If you haven't already, I encourage you to stop by our visitors table out here in the narthex. and. Um, after the service to go ahead and sign up for our weekly email. That's one of the ways we can stay in touch with you. There's a newsletter there. We can meet and answer any questions you may have. And today I invite you to join Reverend Joanna and yours truly uh, after the service for our Exploring Membership class. It will be at 1115 in the library. It's in the hall down that way. Did I say 103? Library. Library is, there's yeah. a text, says 103, in case you don't find the library. <laughs> um, and it's a great way to learn more about this church and this faith. Unitarian Universalism is a non-creedal faith. There are no doctrines you have to agree with in order to belong. Instead, 
We are held together by covenant, our promises to each other in this church and within our religious tradition. Please join me in these words from our historic faith. Love, Love is, is the spirit, spirit of this, this church, church and, and service, service is its law. This, this is our is great, great covenant, covenant to dwell well, together in peace, peace to seek, seek the, the truth, truth in love, and to help one another. We unite the UU churches around the world by lighting our flaming chalice, the symbol of our religion. Today, August, we'll be lighting our chalice. Here and at home, we light it today with these words. Let us open our, all our senses and let our synapses spark one connection, one after another, as we make sense of the world and find joy with each other and follow the instinct to pray, to play, <laughs> to play. Awesome, Luke. Daria, thank you. Uh, this reading today is from Walden, War, Life in the Woods, by Henry David Thoreau, 1854. I went to the woods because I wished to, to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and so Spartan-like as to put, a route, put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath 
and shave close, to drive into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world? Or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. Thus ends our reading. For the past 31 years, Live Oak has been a beacon of love, acceptance, and inclusivity in an area where our values often challenge the status quo. In a world where divisiveness and intolerance seem to grow stronger, we firmly believe in the transformative power of our faith and the positive impact that we are having in our area. We invite you to make a financial contribution to help sustain this church's vital work, knowing that every gift, large and small, is appreciated and carefully used in service to our mission. And if you would like to donate electronically, there is a card with a QR code in the seat back pockets. Now, this congregation is owned by the members it's themselves. Each UU congregation is an independent organization, self-funded and self-governed. And now, our, uh, if he can do two things at once, um, our stewardship team uh, with Joel Burkew are going to give us an update. Actually, can you turn out the lights a little bit, the blackout, so they can see the screen a little bit? All right. So my name is uh, Joel Burkew. And by the way, how about the special music today by Luke? <laughs> and Daria, too. So uh, Live Oak is funded by its members. And as you heard before, uh, we're, we're a free congregation, and so we're not supported by anybody but ourselves. Um, and we made a call late last year for everybody to level up. And what we mean by level up is because um, the, it's natural for costs to uh, go up every year, but especially this year with, with inflation, we're asking, we were asking everybody to level up, uh, which means to donate uh, just a bit more for 2024. Well, the good news is we had a goal of leveling up for $47,000, and we're a little over 90% of our goal, which is, which is great news. Uh, the, the other thing I want to add is about 40% of our, this has come from about 40% of our generous uh, con uh, congregation. So I want to encourage that if you haven't leveled up, Again, we're all in this together. Um, to find out what leveling up means to you, look at your financial situation and see if you can uh, give back to the church. We're gonna have someone from stewardship um, after the service uh, for you to talk about and uh, what leveling up means to you. So thank you so much. Let this time of offering be a reflection of our shared commitment to making a positive impact on the world and a reminder that our Unitarian Universalist values guide us not only in our beliefs but also in our actions. Thank you for your presence here today and your contributions to our ongoing journey of building the beloved community here and in the wider community. We'll build a land where we bind up the broken. We'll build a land where the captives go free. Where the oil of gladness dissolves all mourning. Oh, we'll build a promised land that can be. Come build a land where all of the people anointed by God may then create peace. 
where just a shell roll down like waters and peace like an ever flowing stream. Good morning. I have two helpers that are going to walk around right now who are going to pass out a piece of paper to each household. So if you'll help them point out, like, we just need one, if I can get my two helpers to go start doing that. So Rosie, if you'll go to this side of the room, and Lucia, if you'll do this side of the room. And you're wondering, what are they passing out? Well, today I want to talk to you about spiritual practice and an opportunity for you to engage in spiritual practice through Lent. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? So uh, we have a graphic that we're putting up, and you're also getting the piece of paper to put on your refrigerator, and I'm going to talk about this. So first off, 2024 marks the 10th anniversary of doing UU Lent, and you may or may not have heard of it before, or you may or may not have engaged in it before. UU Lent was created by the Reverend Mr. Barb Grieve as a way for Unitarian Universalists to engage in a shared spiritual practice alongside our siblings in faith who are observing Lent. In some Christian traditions, in preparation for the celebration of Easter, the faith will make a sacrifice, a personal sacrifice, as a way of bringing them closer to God and reminding them of the sacrifices that Jesus and his followers made. However, rather than engage in a practice of self-denial, UU Lent is an invitation to spend the season of Lent engaged in a spiritual discipline of deep intention and an appreciation of our world, our place in it, and an openness to grace in our daily lives. As Unitarian Universalists, we share theological roots with our Christian siblings. Early Unitarian Universalists observed Lent and many continue to do so to this day. At the beginning of the Skinner House Books creation in the early 1960s, the UUA published a Lenten, um, Lenten materials to help practitioners. You need some more? Let's see if Rosie has some. There you go. I'm gonna start over. Hey, if you didn't get one, we'll get you one at the end. Thank you so much for your help. As I was saying, the UUA published Lenten materials for you used to be able to engage in a Lenten practice. And today, um, we have the intentional Reverend Mr. Barb Grieve has created this new approach, a modern day approach, to help us recognize and celebrate and do a spiritual practice with Lent. In a nod to the beautiful and faithful language and faithful work of the UUA's Article II Study Commission, this year, UU Lent words are organized around the newly articulated values. Each week focuses on a different value ending on Sunday where the value itself is the focus. UU Lent is designed to be used individually or as a family or as a congregation. And for each day in Lent, a word has been selected. Each day, participants are invited to reflect on the meaning of the day's word, then create a photograph of that that represents the word, the idea, the practice, or concept, and share it on social media with hashtag UULent. There is also a UULent Facebook page. Beginning on Ash Wednesday, which is next Wednesday, and going for 40 days, each day until Easter, the word for the day and a related quote will be posted on that Facebook page. Participants are invited to reflect and engage through the day, checking for the word and quote in the morning, then coming back later in the day and adding your photo. I want you to do something. Pull out your phones. Pull out your phone. Put it on photo. Now I want you to consider the word love because we are centered in love. Now, I invite all of you in this room to find something that represents love to you and take a photo. So you can get up, you can move around if you need to. And then I want you to post it on the Live Oak UU Facebook page.
Hashtag UU Lent. Have you got your pictures? Sometimes we're surrounded by something, an idea, a feeling, a spiritualness in the world that we don't even notice. But we bring intention to it with this program, with this idea of looking. Oh my gosh, there's love in the window because it was just a squirrel. That was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's like, just what do you see? What do you notice? What does this word mean to you? And how can you bring it into a deeper practice in your life? So I can't wait to see what you posted. This will be really interesting. It's interesting. And I'm, we will continue this for the 40 days of Lent. And with that, I invite you to spiritual practice. Thank you. Please rise as you are willing and able for him 18. What wondrous love. Tuesday. What's happening Tuesday? Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras, Shrove Tuesday, Pancake Day, Fat Tuesday, all those different times. It's the time to let loose and party and have indulgence. Eat up the king cake and the pancakes and how is it pronounced? Pashki? That. You can ask the people who have lived in Chicago later about, about that one. But it's a time of excess. And why, why, what's the meaning? What happens the next day? Lent. Lent, that's right. The next day is when Lent begins. 40 days, 
going from this Tuesday through Easter. And Lent is for many, not all, but for many Christian traditions. It's considered to be a time of sacrifice, a time of repentance, and a time of suffering, of deliberate suffering, redemptive suffering. That, that's the term that is often used. And in certain strains of Christianity, I, I would say most, definitely Catholic, Anglican, but, but also some of the Protestant ones, there is this idea that suffering, simply for the sake of suffering, brings you closer to holiness. Not suffering that simply happens, you know, an acceptance of the fact that this is part of life, is that there is going to be pain, there is going to be suffering, but actually a way of taking the whole idea of your suffering and saying that this brings you into holiness. Now, this comes from a couple of ideas. One is original sin. We talked about that last week. The idea that you are born so broken that you need some suffering in order to sort of make up for that. And it also comes from the idea of atonement, right? This idea of substitutionary atonement. I don't know that they were taught this, but I know that uh, many of my little Catholic friends when I was in elementary school, would the message that they took away was, Jesus died for your sins. The least you can do is give up chocolate until Easter. Unitarian Universalism, both before we merged in 1961 when we were two different religious denominations and who we are now, has historically rejected both the doctrine of original sin, the idea that we are all born bad, and the idea of substitutionary atonement, that we needed something to step in that God was so wrathful that we needed an intermediary, that neither of those have ever been a part of our systematic theology. This idea of suffering being something that draws you closer to God because you are somehow willingly going into this, willingly going into the suffering that they say Jesus went through. This has done so much damage in our culture. And just as original sin has sort of gone beyond the boundaries of the religion it came from and has affected our whole culture, I would say this, this fetish, fetishization of suffering has as will, as, as many of us know, because whenever we have gone through something really terrible, really painful. There has probably been at least one person in our lives who has tried to lift up our suffering, right? Everything happens for a reason. For me, it was when my seven-month-old daughter was diagnosed with cancer, and I was in seminary at the time, and I was told, this will make you a better minister. That was not helpful, and I would say it did not. It made me a different minister. By the way, for those who don't know, she's fine now. <laughs> it made me a different minister. It did not make me a better minister. This idea that we have to have suffering in our lives to be able to become all we are supposed to be. Think of all of the tropes about the suffering artist. That doesn't mean that we can't still find meaning in those hard times. I am a big believer that if you have to go through hell, I hope that you don't come out empty-handed. But I don't believe that that is based in suffering for its own sake. 
Suffering has done so much damage. This, this concept of redemptive suffering has done so much damage in our world. Priests and pastors have used it to tell abused wives that that suffering that they are going through brings them closer to God, brings them closer to Jesus, and that one day their abuser is going to look at them meekly withstanding all of that suffering, and it's going to save them. This is a common one. It has been used to justify things like slavery. In recent times, Mother Teresa, now Saint Teresa, she was fast-tracked to, I mean, she was, they, that, like, that's, that's not opinion, that's actually, it was nine years, that's actually considered a fast-track. She was fast-tracked to becoming a saint. But back when she was alive, she gave a commencement address at Thomas Aquinas College in 1982, and she was telling about being with a woman who was dying of cancer, and she told the woman, pain and suffering have come into your life, but remember, pain, sorrow, suffering are but the kiss of Jesus, a sign that you have come so close to him that he can kiss you. And then she laughed as she told of the woman's response. The woman said, Mother, please tell Jesus to stop kissing me. And she and the audience all laughed at this idea. If it were just ideas, if it were just talking to a dying woman and telling her to embrace that suffering, that that God that they worshipped that that made him happy for her to suffer. What kind of a God is this? That's not a God, that's a monster. If it had just been ideas, that would be bad enough, but it has been well documented. Yes, I'm attacking Mother Teresa. It has been well, it has, our beliefs guide our actions, and it has been well documented that she would not obtain and give out adequate painkillers to those who were dying and suffering. Ideas have consequences. And this idea of redemptive suffering has made the world worse, not better. So we are coming up on Ash Wednesday. Oh, let me add this. This is, so Rebecca Parker and Rita Brock are two Unitarian Universalist theologians who wrote a powerful, it is painful, but a powerful book called Proverbs of Ashes, Violence, Redemptive Suffering, and the Search for What Saves Us. And they went into their own personal experiences of suffering and how they had to break free of this idea that it was being caused by a God who gloried in them suffering. And they said, the spiritualizing of suffering makes God the author of all pain, who uses pain to edify or purify human beings. So this idea of suffering, for many people, has been what is underneath their whole Lenten practice. This idea of, okay, for 40 days, I am going to voluntarily enter into some suffering. Again, Jesus died for your sins. The least you can do is give up chocolate for 40 days. It's not really the deepest theological idea. Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. And it is the start of the Lenten season. But what it is based in is less the suffering and more a simple fact. And frankly, this is a ritual that really speaks to me, even though I am not a Christian. Your Christian friends, when you see them with that smudge on their forehead, have gone and the priest or the pastor, if it is part of their tradition, marks them 
with the ashes from the palm fronds of last year, of last Palm Sunday that have been burned to ashes, marks them with that and says, you are ashes and you will return to ashes. And I don't find this morbid at all. I find this life-affirming because what this is saying is that our time here is finite. It is a reminder that we are mortal. The clock is ticking. And frankly, we, so, it's so easy to get going just on autopilot. It's easy to lose sight of that, to think that we have all the time in the world or to make little things far more serious than they are. It is good to occasionally pause our dancing and say, do you guys ever think about dying? As Barbie did. This idea that we are ashes is not something exclusively Christian. Rabbi Reese told me of a story, and I went and looked at uh, Mar- the uh, Jewish theologian and philosopher Martin Buber in Tales of the Hasidim, tells this story of a rabbi who said that everyone should have two cards, one in each of their pockets so that they can pull out whichever one it is that they need to see. And on one of the cards, it says, for you, all of this was made. And the other card says, you are but earth and ashes. Because both of those are true. What an amazing gift when we stop, when we take the time to be mindful and think about it, that we have been born, that we even exist, that we get to see the sky and the moon, the eclipse that is coming, the grass and the faces of people we love. We get to experience things. We get to be, have bodies. We get to do all of these things. This world was made for you. And at the same time, we are animals. We are part of the earth. We are not apart from it. And we will one day all return to it. Millions and millions of people since the start of of our evolution, we each get, as far as we know, one lifetime. When we remember that, then we can make a Lenten practice of taking 40 days to become more mindful to remember that our lives are finite, and to really think about what is it that we are going to do. Like I said, Lent is 40 days, Ash Wednesday until Easter. What's really interesting is that there is something about this 40 days that speaks to humans. It is not, again, it is not just a Christian concept. When you look at the Hebrew Bible, you have Moses who went up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and you have the the ark, right, and the rains and the storms, 40 days and 40 nights, and Jesus who goes into the wilderness to fast and to pray 40 days. You have other traditions as well. You have the the Buddha uh, going and meditating for 49 days. There are things within certain sects of Hinduism that pull on this 40 days. There is something about that 40 days that speaks to us. And even in psychology, it seems like every couple of years they, they, they move things on how many days it takes to start a habit. Have you noticed this? Like one time they're like 21 days and then the last one I saw, no, 66 days. I don't think there's actually a magic number, but 40, let's split the difference, like 40 is kind of in the middle of that. So what will you do with your 40 days? As Mary Oliver wrote, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? What are the barriers for you 
that keep you from being able to be mindful, from not just going on autopilot, from realizing the world around you and this amazing experience of life that we all get. There's this wonderful line, Jimmy Buffett has this song called He Went to Paris, where he is talking through the voice of an old man at the end of his life. And the old man says, some of it was magic, some of it was tragic, but I had a good life all the way. What can you do for 40 days so that you are keeping that idea right in front? Lent does not have to be about suffering. If you want to get rid of something, abstain from something from 40 days, find what it is that is a barrier to you living the most fulfilled life in the circumstances that we are all living right now. What would be a barrier? Can you abstain from that for 40 days? And if you want to embrace something, don't embrace suffering for suffering's sake. Embrace what is life-giving and life-affirming. Embrace what makes you the most mindful and fills you with gratitude for being alive and sets you up so that you can both receive and put more love out into the world. Laissez le bon temps rouler. I invite you now to join me in a time of meditation or reflection in word or in silence. Kind of make yourself a little bit more comfortable, remove any distractions from your lap. And if you feel comfortable doing so, close your eyes so that you can give yourself this moment of going inward. And these words are by my good friend and colleague, the Reverend Chris Jimerson of First UU Austin. This is Who Am I to Not Be Blessed? In moonlit shadows, at the edge of night-darkened oak trees, I see it. Across sunny pathways, in the buzzing of insects, among the flowering forest greenery, I hear it. From the touch of ones loved, the embraces of those gone before me, I feel it. In the poems I love dearly, the songs that speak to my heart, the sculpture that catches my imagination, the discoveries still to be made, I sense it. It is in the fire of distant suns, the cool drip of waters, the slight chill in the breeze, the laughter of children no matter what their age, young and old, grown and still small. It is the breath of life, the stardust of souls, the magic of remembrance. Who am I to not surrender to it in gratitude? Who am I to not be blessed? Let's hold that for a moment in sacred stillness. Amen and blessed be. And would you please join me in singing? When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, 
I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. This community is a chosen village where our lives are interconnected. Part of the tapestry of this communal journey is sharing the significant milestones, joys, and sorrows in our lives and witnessing the diversity that we hold. One of us may be celebrating a life event while another is mourning a grief. And there is a beauty in that mosaic as we are reminded that these moments of life are transient and ever-changing. Today, Nico shares, my good friend Willow passed on January 30th. Keep her in your hearts and treasure the time you have with loved ones. Celeste shares, I'm excited to be attending DICE or DICE? DICE in Vegas this week with my husband in hopes of connecting with funding for his startup. And Jess O'Rell shares that Kate O'Rell is three on Tuesday. May this community draw closer with our shared experiences as we celebrate life's triumphs and navigate its trials together. So may you to this Mardi Gras, let the good times roll and may you continue that forward. May you find what it is that will help you live the life that you want to live so that when you reach Easter, you can say, that was a really good first step. As Henri Frederick Emile writes, life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us, so be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Go in peace and go in love. This is your invitation to faith development today. First, I want to say, if you're looking for the UU Lent, um, you can find it, an article about it and the image in the Roots and Wings newsletter. That comes out weekly. That's faith development for all ages. So if you think it's just for families, it's not. It's got information for our youth, our young adults, our emerging adults, our adult faith development. It has spiritual practice and all sorts of resources for you to engage deeper in your faith. And I encourage you to check it out, Roots and Wings. And saying that, we have a lot of things going on today. So as Mike mentioned earlier, we have well, uh, our exploring membership class in the library with Reverend Joanna and the membership team. So if you are interested in learning more about Live Oak and Unitarian Universalism and exploring being a member, please drop into the library in room 103. If you are interested this morning in dropping in room 105 with the JEDI team, stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, there, the team is doing the anti-racism discussion. This is based on um, 
questions from the anti-racist deck by Ingram X. Kendi. And these are meaningful and powerful conversation starters about equity and justice. And the goal of this class is to foster group discussions that will lead to anti-racism racism change on a micro level in our community, in our congregation, and in the wider world. So that's a drop in if you'd like to go there. For the rest of us in the fellowship hall, there are some really cool rocking things going on. On the tables, you're gonna see that one, you have the table discussions questions that Reverend Joanna writes for you, for you to be able to sit together and engage in a deeper conversation about the sermon that you heard today. I encourage you to do that while making valentines. There is a lot of craft material out there for you to make valentines. Why are we making valentines? This is a social action for all ages. We're making cards that will be sent tomorrow to the social justice workers and the immigrants that they assist at Eagle Pass. They have had a really rough week dealing with the convoy and they need some love and support. So I, please make Valentine's. If you're not into crafting, on this side of the room there's just cards where you can just write a note. So I encourage you to show some love to these folks Put your completed Valentines and note cards in the basket on the snack table. This includes all the kids today. So all the kids and the teens will be making Valentines in the fellowship hall. And our youngest uh, pre-K through kind, uh, first grade will be in room 111 and they will be hearing the mishmash heart and also making a special heart for, um, for somebody special. So I invite you to engage. There's so many different ways to engage. And I hope to see you in one of these spaces today. Thank you. Please join me in extinguishing our chalice with these words by Unitarian Universalist Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear. And the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. Let us leave the ser this service with renewal in our spirit and a song in our heart. Please rise for number 34, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire. to be together today. Please spend the next five minutes 
talking with someone you don't know. Show them where the visitor's table is located along with the coffee out here. And may we all know the blessings of friendship. I hope to see you all again next week.